Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, July the 18th. I'd like to start by thanking our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every two weeks. Um, our first guest is Chris Zamuda, and this segment is called A Cannabis Sandwich in Victoria. And uh, Chris, unfortunately for him, was part of the sandwich, and he didn't want to be, but he got stuck. And, and so we're just going to be talking about his story. So, Chris, um, basically, you're saying that for a year and a half, um, your small business, which was on Douglas Street... 1412. 14, whereabouts is that? Between, between Johnson and Pandora. Okay, between Johnson and Pandora on Douglas, called uh, European... Taste of Europe Delhi. Taste of Europe Delhi. You've had to move. Yeah. And, um, and you think it was because of... Um, well, you can just tell us. Um, as you said, I'm the, my name is Chris Muda, and I'm the business owner of the Taste of Europe. And thank you to have me here and uh, having the chance to talk about this. And uh, the problem uh, became uh, when the illegal cannabis moving next door, they call them the Terp City. And uh, they start uh, from the beginning, they start harass me by noise and by other ways, you know, to affect my business, you know, harass my employees. Uh, the phone calls, you know, the strange phone calls when I try to call police uh, for help, you know. And then I start uh, going to the city hall and talk about and get some uh, help. So I have the chance to spoke one-on-one uh, -on -one with Lisa Helps, the mayor of Victoria. And she promised uh, to look at the issue, but she never did. So then I tried to talk about the, to the business department and nothing. I talked to the bylaw office, nothing, you know. So uh, then finally, you know, just uh, I got the chance to see the MLA Hello, James. Uh, also, I didn't get response. And then only the one man who helped me, the person was a member of parliament, Mr. Rankin, who had the time to come to my store, uh, talk about a lesson, talk, and uh, promised me to help me out uh, to find a d different location. And he did. And he did. So now I'm located on the 735 Yet Street. Um, and I tried for last 10 months to uh, approach, you know, the mayor and city council uh, with my issues, but they keep ignoring me until today, sending me letters that is they pro, uh, pursuing, pursuing, and pursuing, and pursuing. So, I mean, for me, I'm not against, uh, I'm, I, I'm glad that, people are going to be able to deal with cannabis legally. Yeah. But it wasn't that it was a cannabis shop. It was the fact that they were making a lot of noise. Yes. That's, you know, and I, I don't want to be under the Victoria by law, yeah, the I issues. Mean, if, if you're one shop, you should not be bothering either the people walking by or next the shops next door with loud music. But I noticed that happening actually more and more in different places. People feel they have the right to just crank it up and not care about their neighbors. So that's what I, to me, that, that's just crazy. And then people smoking outside and, and disturbing you, because a lot of people don't like the smell of the smoke. Yeah, that's why I was losing the, the business. My business was going to toilet, basically. They squeezed me out, finally, you know, from that location, I couldn't stand anymore. And because they didn't even shut down the illegal business, but they approved another one on the right side. So I was the cannabis sandwich, just 20 meters from each other. It's impossible. They didn't enforce any federal law. They didn't enforce any Victoria by law. They sworn on the job to follow and protect us, you know, small legal businesses. But they, they fail. They fail in any aspect, you know, uh, and completely, you know, uh, I was without any choices than move out. You mentioned that um, the role, the, what the police tried to do, and and the landlords. No landlords uh, lean 
uh, <coughs> exactly on the cannabis business. Probably they pay him cash uh, or maybe more money than I can. Then just uh, he didn't want to listen. He just wanted me to get out, you know, from the place as well because they have the plan to expand the cannabis business. And if you know today, you can go 1412, you can see some other bistro coming, but I don't know when because uh, uh, government of Canada, they postponed the uh, legal businesses, you know, uh, with marijuana from July 1st to the October 17th. So they on hold, but they become the cannabis district over there. Yeah, I guess, I guess it is. And, uh, and the police? No, police always coming when I uh, call them, but they said to me that not much they can do. They can go only to ask them to be quiet and they left, you know, after the 10, 15 minutes they left, they come back, you know, with the noise, you know, so, uh, and the city of Victoria didn't protect me from that point, you know, like to bring some equipment for, to prove evidence or something. You know, I asked many of my customers, what you can do if you can be the mayor of Great Victoria? If somebody bring you the issues that uh, illegal operation harass legal business, what you can do? Everybody answer, shut down them because they not respect the, the neighbors. But what the mayor and city council did, nothing, completely nothing. And you're the one who had to shut down. And yeah, then. and I'm the consequences of negligence, you know, and disobey the bylaw uh, of the city council and mayor um, in Victoria. Yeah, I was just talking to somebody today about noise and they said they had just started to notice how crazily noisy the city is and we're not even a big city but uh, there's no, there seems to be no interest, no interest anywhere in a little peace and quiet which I think everybody needs. That's right. And you know, uh, I hear the many uh, supports, you know, the people have the problem around the city but I don't know uh, how the city responds to others, but uh, they spread the wrong information to my supporters. For example, Council Ben Isid, he wrote a uh, response to my supporters that the issue is only the, between landlords and tenants, which was wrong because I should be protected by Victoria by law. So I don't know why he responded, maybe probably he didn't have a chance to maybe read it by law and study. So there was wrong response and I, I just, uh, right now I'm just seeking the apology from the city hall management and compensation because I lost $30,000 of my business and plus moving expenses from one occasion and I don't understand why because for last four years I was success businessman there and then I have the nice review from TripAdvisor Yelp in the, in the Google, something people like my uh, authentic in European food. And, but for somehow, some reason, city of Victoria management fail. Well, you're not the only one they failed. I think the city of Victoria management fails a lot of people a lot of the time. It's really, really, really unfortunate. They have many, many, yeah, many issues. You know, they, they don't know how to handle. Um, so like, from my perspective, as a small business, a legal small business operator, operator, I can only tell them, you got fire. They should just start packing. And in we city should- city council. Yeah, uh, including mayor and city council, we should get all new staff in new election 2018. To I think a lot of people would agree with that. Yeah, and I, I, so. I mean, I know the city, a lot of the city councillors, you know, at least to say hello to if I ever happen to see them. And, you know, they're nice people, but as a city council, and I can go back for 30 years, which is when I first started to get involved with sort of city affairs, the city councils never seem able to really do their job, which is to protect the interests of the people of the city. They're nice people, but they can't do the job. As a city council, they're hopeless, just hopeless. And it's really damaging to our city when, when that's the case. We need something better. 
and I don't know how we can get it, but I know we have that need. It's got nothing to do with the individual counselors. It's just there is a problem with having decent, competent, capable city government. It's just not there. They're yeah. not, they're, th these people are not capable of doing the job. They don't have the training and whatever else it is they don't have, but they're nice people. I don't fault them and they go in with good intentions, but it just, it gets turned completely around. Yes, you're correct. Like, uh, for example, when the September 2017, there was the news on the time colonies that uh, Lisa Helps, mayor of Victoria, going to shut down my neighbor, Terp City, because he's the worst in, in the town. And the consumption of the break, all kind of law. But month after the city council love day, he said, give them the license. So I was so confused in, you know, like what they are doing. Completely out of the mind, you know, like uh, disagreement between each other. They do what they want. I don't see any skills they have it to run the Great Victoria. That's what I repeat. We need a new city management 2000, 2018 election. That's for sure. Uh, Chris, you've got some notes here. Is there anything else you wanna you wanna go over? Well, actually, though, it's uh, maybe one more thing that the question: of what to do? Yes, what to do? What to do? Like the question is for the city management of Victoria: what to do? Like, why is this the hard problem for them? Why they can? Why can't why? they do anything? Yes, yeah. that's why right. Why don't they do anything? And a lot of people on a lot of different issues would ask exactly the same thing. Why? What's wrong? Every what's two wrong? weeks they have the public meeting with the city council, and I hear about many issues. People coming to have it, you know, and they don't listen. They don't listen. They ignore everybody, including me. Yeah, I think a lot of people would agree with that too. They ignore everybody. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Chris, uh, thank you very much. Uh, is there anything else you want to go over? Or you? Um, yeah. it's, a, it's, you know, it's like uh, an interesting and, and sad story of what happens to somebody who just happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or maybe one more thing is like the, I think the mayor and the city council encourage cannabis shops even they, they think they're restricted by law. So they even by themselves, they're confusing what to do. Yeah, I can sort of understand that because it's, it was worse before to have gangs on the street selling it. Yeah. So, but there's got to be rules. You can't have a society if you don't have rules and regulations. A society does not work if there's no yeah. rules and regulations. And the rules and regulations have got to be good for the broad mass of people and they've got to be enforced. If that's not happening, then there's big trouble and we're seeing it everywhere in our, in our society. They admit that they received 42 applications for cannabis shops in, in downtown Victoria. And they issue 13 licenses to them and 29 still uh, operate illegal. And they know under the umbrella of the city hall management. They know what's going on. They don't do anything about it. But I don't think you even care if the shop is there as long as it's not bothering you. Yes. That's the problem. That's why. Many people say, oh, you can have a more business because after they can get munchy, yeah. they can come and eat your food. Every day, I'm very happy. Yeah, but no, nothing, nothing like that. Only harassment. Chris, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, thank you. One small story in our city. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back, it's the Walton Jack Show. It is Wednesday, July the 18th, and we're gonna be starting off with um, a human rights issue, human rights and why, Wi-Fi. Yeah, th this is a story that we've been covering over the, over the last couple of years, but <clears throat> basically the BC Human Rights Tribunal has refused to even hear a human rights complaint from a boy and his family who claim that Wi-Fi and cell phone radiation at their school is harming the boy. And the names of the claimants have been protected for privacy reasons. Okay, I'm just gonna throw in, yeah. 
in Europe, this is an accepted problem. Yeah. It's in the science, it, it's in the society, but here we pretend it doesn't exist. Well, we're trying to, but, but the, the truth does leak through. So. Uh, the, the family was requesting that 25% of a school uh, grounds in, in School District 63 uh, be free of Wi-Fi radiation. That was basically what the request was. Uh, their tribunal rejected it, it, all independent expert opinion and re relied solely on Health Canada, the World Health Organization, the World Health Organization, and the BC Cancer Agency. And uh, many people claim that these organizations are captured and controlled by the industry. And we'll talk about that a little further. We don't have to talk about it. They are controlled by the well, industry. Well, we can get into the details because there are a lot of a lot of facts that support that. The tri the tribunal itself is stacked by political appointees from 14 years of liberal government. So they've, they put all sorts of people on this tribunal that with questionable credentials as far as I'm concerned. And uh, basically there's been many calls for the tribunal to be scrapped and a, a, a full on human rights commission be instituted in British Columbia that has real teeth and, and, and has, will have some fairness. Now, uh, we hope to have Sharon Noble on in a couple of weeks uh, uh, and to go over this case and, 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 and look at more of the aspects of it. But basically, it's, it, we have a situation where we have, again, uh, our media, including the CBC, re doing a very, very superficial report of this story, not looking into any of the issues that the people are claiming for, for harm, and just just uh, mouthing the words that, that they're told by the tribunal and by these other health authorities. All of these health authorities, by the way, have had reams of literature written about them and, and the poor quality uh, that they serve to the people. And they all have direct influences from industry. Sometimes direct funding, like the World Health, health Organization, um, and all through, just through, through political ideology and bureaucratic ideology that they were able to create this system where nothing really can happen. Now, I think we've just seen that in the previous interview where, where it doesn't matter what common sense is, it doesn't matter what the real reality is, as long as these bureaucracies can grind on and den deny the reality and deny these facts, these people all will have their jobs, basically. They're there to protect the industry, many people will claim, not to protect the public, but protect the industry from, from claims. So this is uh, a school, um, what, is it uh, elementary or middle? It's a middle school okay. in, in School District 63. Now, sensitivity to Wi-Fi is I mean, to me, there's no question that a lot of people have it. I think in Europe, they, they accept a number of two to three or four percent, something like that. Would, is that is that a number? Well, that you can know, be used? Uh, Dr. Martin Blank, uh, who has just recently passed away, and uh, uh, a, really a world-renowned researcher in this area, will tell you that all people are affected by exposure to electromagnetic radiation. Yes. Some people display, display symptoms. Now that could be in different situations, a higher or lower percentage of the population. But we all share the same biology. Our cells all respond to this type of radiation in the same way. Okay. And, all, and, and what this young man wants and his family is a school where he can go to because he cannot go to a school where there is Wi-Fi, right? He has a hard time being anywhere near any type of uh, electromagnetic radiation wireless devices. So, I mean, what do you think? To me, it, it doesn't, why, why is it such a big deal to have one school in the system that is at least partly free, because that's all they're asking for. It's that one school, part of the school can be free of Wi-Fi. Yeah. I mean, is that too much to ask in this crazy world of ours? It is. <clears throat> You know, that's when you do get into denial and, and about human nature. And we've seen it time and time again. If you look at climate change deniers, for instance, uh, the evidence is overwhelming, but still there's a portion of the population that just will not want to listen to that. Uh, we have a, a society that's full of people using wireless technology, and they have a hard time comprehending the possibility 
that that type of technologies could be harming them. They would think, oh, well, our health authorities must know what they're doing, therefore we don't have to really investigate. And uh, school officials, school boards, uh, loathe to take any position that's not absolutely given to them from uh, higher up authorities. So when the chief medical health officer, who by the way has no credentials whatsoever in making any statements based on this type of technology because he has no background other than other doctors, I mean, he does have some, some health you know, uh, credentials, but when he makes these grand statements saying that there's no harm, he really can't be trusted because he really is not looking at the literature. We could support that with hundreds of documents of showing that this, uh, there is harm to, to humans and to biology, uh, that's irrefutable. So we have to simply, we're stuck in this situation where we have people, brave people come forward uh, and dispute the, uh, the official line on this and uh, they're shut down. Are there other places in the world where some schools are free of Wi-Fi? Yeah, in France, they're, they're, all their kindergartens are free of Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, I don't know uh, that, don't have an answer to that. There are people, there are different places in the world that are protecting their people at different levels of protection. Right. Uh, industry is fighting tooth and nail. Every, every issue, every case is fought long and hard. They are the richest and most powerful industry in the world, Jack. So what are you going to get? you're not going to have much success unless you really and truly look at the fundamental issues and really look for the truth. Let's face it. Yeah. Let's really look at the evidence and acknowledge it and not get caught up in this bureaucracy that they've thrown at us. Do not allow any change. And to me, it's uh, Wi-Fi is exactly the same as smoking. You know, yeah. it was everybody said it was safe and even though they knew, but they all said it was safe and in the end, the amount of suffering and death. And I saw a number of years ago, somebody I knew died of uh, emphysema caused by smoking. He smoked almost right to the end. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible death. And the industry that sold him all the cigarettes didn't care for one second. And to me, the Wi-Fi industry is the same. You know, we go into it as children. Oh, I want to have a cell phone, I want to have a cell phone, and, you know, everything is okay because you don't notice anything. It's yeah. just... Uh... Well, I have to imagine, like, we have five billion cell phone users on this planet. How many people are on the planet? I think it's six billion. One guy sitting on a little cable vision TV show saying, no, this is not good, folks. You've got to be careful. This might be harmful. It's just going by. They would, it's so easy to dismiss what I'm saying because of all this preponderance of propaganda that they get daily, it's, it's very hard for folks to turn around and, and really wonder, especially when they're carrying around a cell phone. And they love it. Everybody I know, and it. all the crew and everybody yeah. here all has cell phones. So I know when they look at, you know, the public looks at what I'm saying, it does look a little odd and strange, but the thing is, is that if anybody cares to, and then we'll, we'll give some uh, links and things to go to, uh, especially the bioinitiative report is, is what I always refer to because it's such a clear and definitive statement about the, the, the status of the situation and the things that we can really do. We can do a lot of things to reduce our exposure. We don't have to just throw away our cell phones and do all this other stuff. There are things to really dramatically reduce the level of radiation in the environment. That's where we should be headed. But we're headed in the exact opposite direction. Well, almost. I don't think we can stick a cell phone in any more people's hands. I think we pretty well have all, all you can get. And but plus, you, we're moving to 5G, which, 5G. Is, which is expanding the amount of radiation in everybody's neighborhood because they, they want better coverage. There was a time when we used to fight uh, cell phone towers and cell phone transmitters coming into communities. Now, uh, in a community like Brentwood Bay, which would have been served by one cell phone transmitter, now it's over a hundred transmitters uh, been installed by TELUS there with this new 5G technology, and they'll be beaming radiation right at those houses 24/7.
Is there any um, reaction from within Brentwood Bay about this? Is Brentwood Bay the first place on the island where no, it's No, they're happened? doing it all over the all world. Right, yeah. uh, and most people aren't aware. Yeah. And uh, How would you getting be aware? back to that idea of denial, Jack, <clears throat> uh, I sympathize with people. And this is a complicated issue. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, you have this cell phone, for instance, that's so convenient you know, you're a super person, you're a superman when you have a cell phone. The whole world, the whole world of information. And is that's right. how they yeah, sort of yeah. market it. It's, it's incredible. So it's such a huge jump yeah. to go from, aren't I wonderful and look what I have to, oh my gosh, maybe this device is hurting me and hurting my family. Yeah. It's just a huge jump and most people can't, can't make it. But it is hurting you and your family, so that's the problem. Okay. Um, is that linked to the um, bio initiative report? We'll put out? the bio initiative report up for for the folks, and we also have a link uh, to an article I wrote on PowerToThePeople.ca regarding the, the the story. And I'm going to put another article up on Power to the People, and hopefully we can get Sharon Noble on next next uh, show, and she can give us a lot of the the juicy details on what's happened. Okay. I want to do a PR update. PR is proportional representation. So where we're at right now, and this is the middle of July, is that the ballot has been created. This, this is the ballot that we are going to be voting on. Um, and there's two questions on it. The vote will take place in the fall, beginning around mid-October and continuing until the end of November. And there's two questions on the ballot. Question one, um, which system should British Columbia use for provincial elections? And you can choose either the current first-past-the-post system or a proportional representation system. So that's question one. And question two is, if, if we do change to PR, which system would you like? And there's three choices. Now, you can answer one question or you can answer both questions or you can skip the vote altogether and not even vote but you only have to answer one or you can answer both um, I really hope that people will agree that we should move to what I think is a more democratic voting system which is proportional representation uh, the opposition is well funded and is spending big money to make sure we don't um, they're not necessarily interested in the truth either. They're interested in winning. So be careful in believing them. Be careful in believing our side too. But um, at least we're trying, I think, to be honest. The other side, they don't care about honesty. They care about winning. And they don't want PR because it is more democratic. And for the people at the top, the 1%, more democracy is the last thing they want. So. Um, that's coming up uh, in the near future. Elections BC is going to have very shortly some information on the various systems. I think we just heard that we have one minute left. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, Walt, any last issues or? Well, the thing is, uh, I would like to comment on the on the uh, on the Fair Vote BC and and uh, Fair Vote Canada and. and uh, I like to thank them for the fantastic work they're doing. Mostly volunteers, very dedicated, very educated folks, and uh, very enlightening the, what they're doing and, and how they're presenting their case. Very positive and uh, very, uh, very helpful uh, sort of approach they're using. And I'm pretty confident we're going, that the, we're going to have a change here in British Columbia. I really think this the public really is ready for it. I really, really, really hope you're right. And that's the end of this segment. So thank you very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome to Citizens Forum. And uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Martin Blank. Uh, among other things, uh, Dr. Martin Blank is the author of the book Overpowered. And it's subtitled, what science tells us about the dangers of cell phones and other Wi-Fi age devices. And it's available uh, at Better, Book Sto Better Bookstores and online. So like if I was to look at, and I'm trying to uh, uh, assess whether 
this is a, if this is a real health threat or not. I'm looking on the internet. I'm looking at all the information. I'm looking at references to lots of research and studies. And there t- tends to be two categories of of information coming. One is coming from uh, laboratories and from experiments and looking at cells and all that. And then we get a lot of information that that comes from uh, pop- human population studies, epidemiological studies, and um, uh, I wonder where should I put more weight on um, which which form of information is got a little more scientific oomph, let's say, than than the other. Do you think that the uh, experiments on the cells in the labs uh, give a little more definitive answer? Well, they'll give you an answer. The other gives you a uh, probability, mm-hmm. which is very, very different. Yeah. The answer, when you do an experiment in the lab and you find a certain effect to a certain kind of exposure, you can say, this is the effect. And then in a lab halfway around the world, if they do the same experiment, they should get more or less the same kind of thing within experimental error. Yeah. But the, the fact is that when you set up an epidemiology study, if you don't get the data right, That is, uh, for example, there was one very uh, bad study in which they uh, were trying to find out the effects of cell phones. And so they said, how do we know who's a user and who's not? Well, we have a registry. Those who registered by a certain date will be users, and those who didn't register are not users. Well, the answer is that some of the people who used the cell phone hadn't registered by that date, and so they were listed as (laughs) non-users. And the result is that the results were completely useless. Yeah. because they got intermixed. But on the other hand, there are ways in which one can do this kind of study and, they, and get useful information. For mm. example, there was a, a study where you might even say that without any human interference, these are data that were collected on the incidence of cancer around a big antenna system in San Francisco, the Sutra Tower one. Yeah. And over 50 years, they collected data of the incidence of cancer in Uh, people, children under 19, and they found that there was a decrease in the number as you went further and further away from the tower. And it was, you know, like you'd expect, just the way it worked. And you could just draw circles around that tower and you could see... Basically, the closer you were, the more likely, the the greater the probability that there was a a large number of cancer studies. But the fascinating thing about that study was that when you went two miles away from the tower and you got the incidence of cancer in uh, uh, children under 19, uh, you found that the, uh, the level was a thousand times higher, the level of the incidence was a thousand times higher than what's considered safe. In other words, the at threshold. That, yes, it was above the threshold. In other words, at that level, the stuff, if you, if you had a certain level of exposure, it was considered way below the, uh, the, the threshold. And, and yet the, the fact is that the, uh, uh, these are people who are succumbing to, uh, to cancer, uh, being exposed at, uh, at levels that are, uh, you know, getting that at levels that are much larger than that. Yeah. And I, I mean, the discussion around this, and I think you're finding with... Uh with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the idea about what is safe and what isn't safe and how the government is describing uh, and their definition of safety, let's say Health Canada's definition of safety and, and what in fact happens in, in the real world seems to be two different things. Yeah, well the people who, who set the safety standard are largely non-biologists and non-physicians. There may be a couple on a committee that yeah. may have about uh, a dozen or 20 people, but the fact is that they don't use any kind of uh, real biological criterion because what they say is if this radiation can lay, raise the body temperature to a certain point, right. that's when there's danger. But if it doesn't raise it at that point, there's no danger. Well, these data were collected. They're just statistics that are assembled by the authorities, and they have it on record. Nobody did a study. They just (laughs) happen to be uh, filed this way. And they tell you that at that level, the danger is very much larger than you expected. So, so, you know, you'd have a situation, you know, where I think uh, a lot of these regulations or guidelines that they're using 
was basically set up to keep the human body from just overheating, basically. Was uh, that the, 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 the guidelines? Well, it wasn't so much overheating as that they thought that if it didn't cause any temperature increase by a certain level, then uh, it wasn't dangerous. Right. But, you know, heat itself is dangerous, too. They, yeah. They, they, you get cases of uh, kids that are locked in cars, for example, in the summertime, yeah. and they get so hot they actually die from the yeah. heat. So heat can be dangerous. Yeah, at a certain, you know, especially at those high levels. But I think what I'm getting at is that, say, with the Sutra Tower studies and a study, uh, people were not, their bodies were not being threatened to be he heated up. No. But something else was happening to cause illness. That's no question about that. They certainly, those are the kinds of data that uh, were, were not, they weren't studied in, a, in the sense that we do an epidemiology study now. They were collected. Yeah. They're the kinds of statistics that populations uh, uh, yield just by having people doing different things and yeah. suffering from different things. It's, uh, and that, those are the kinds of data that are nice because yeah. they tell you they yield results. Uh, a lot of epidemiology studies are set up in such a way as to uh, try and shouldn't really say this, but they, they, you try and try and get a result. In other words, you don't want to get certain kinds of results. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure people who set up the studies will deny it, but there are a number of studies that show that this is, in fact, what has been done. Yeah. So it, and they should have known better, which is another way of putting it. Well, you um, know, bias. Humans are biased, whether we like it or not. Yeah. You know, yeah. and we got to find, way, find ways of counteracting that and, and to... To, so that we don't, uh, you know, we don't have a just presupposed result. Yeah, but there are ways of it. being clever. And there, are yeah. other, there are other ways of being so transparently biased that yeah. it looks real bad for the, uh, for the case that they're trying to make. You know, I, in, back uh, must be 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, there were several power line studies that, yes. that uh, sh was this more or less like the Sutra Tower uh, research where they just looked at who lived near power lines, uh, looked at the load on those power lines and extrapolated how large the magnetic field would be or the electric fields, and then came up with a model which was fairly accurate because they did have historical data on how much power was going through those wires because it was uh, the power companies kept that. And I think they did come up with statistics that show that there was an association between how close you lived to those power lines and your likelihood of having certain diseases. Yes, childhood leukemia. Leukemia was, was fundamentally what they were looking at. Right. Now, that evidence was fairly powerful, I, I thought, and there were several studies. Remember the New York state power line? Yes, they did. They, they and, and Dr. David Carpenter, and that was a very interesting political situation there yeah. and uh and they were time, seeming time and time again coming up with results which indicated a problem but nevertheless it never seemed to it, it never seemed to equate into changing government policy oh, or it, regulations it did, it did influence the uh the what was it when they set the uh the standards to say that it was a possible carcinogen Right. That was in 1992, I think, when they set that one. And that was the study that was mainly the, uh, or that and a group of other studies, but it was on childhood leukemia mm -hmm. that they actually uh, used those data to uh, indicate the possibility. Yeah, I think the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, did have a report that, that, that they were going to make that statement. But I don't think it ever was officialized, or I was think, it? I think it was, okay. yes, it was a, a, the word was possible carcinogen. Yeah. So that's a, a, that's a category. A big, that's, a big, uh, that's a big stumbling block, because <laughs> now people are trying to uh, uh, take the, the same thing with uh, radio frequency, which is what we're at now, yeah. uh, where, which the, is at the same level, it, that it's a possible carcinogen, and people are now saying 
that perhaps it should be changed. Not perhaps, that, there's, that there is evidence now that, uh, that one should make it a probable carcinogen. Right. And the reason is that there are, there are new data that are indicating that the, uh, the likelihood is, uh, is greater. There are, more, there are more data and they're more definitive. But of course, they're not, they're data. That's one of the problems with epidemiology. You yeah. only deal with things in the probability. It's not like a cell, a cell biology yeah. study, and that's the stuff that uh, the stuff that we were doing for many years at Columbia University, and where we could actually find that there were studies that were done. Uh, you can establish that there's a threshold at which certain yeah. changes occur and that these changes are affecting the functioning of, of the cell. Now, yeah. one other, I should uh, okay. just mention that the, one of the studies that was done very early on, 1992, by uh, Henry Lai and Narendra Singh, which found that if you expose DNA to uh, this radiation, you found that, or to 60 hertz signals, you yeah. found that the DNA actually split little pieces off. You get fragments. And the longer you expose it, the more fragments you got. Well, that's a pretty strong indication that you're causing damage. But they didn't do that in, inside the cell. This was the DNA was out. But now they've just done a study where they've uh, done it inside the cells and they find that there are fragments that result from this kind of exposure, which I think is, is a very strong indication that the, the, uh, the officials ought to move on to the next category, that it's probable. And uh, it yeah. really is a very strong indication that the, the damage is certainly gonna lead to problems and uh, that could very well result in cancer. Yeah, I think that was reported in uh, Microwave News, which, yes. which you can get online. And, and uh, I can't remember the institute that did the study, the American Toxicology. I, I think it was, it's one of the uh, NIH things, I think. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember it exactly, so I better shouldn't say. But that's uh, like uh, kind of falls into what I was saying. Like To me, that is the kind of harder evidence because it's a physical re result physical response that can be replicated and uh, and you can easily extrapolate that you know if that happens in cells there's a good chance that's going to happen inside our bodies yeah you know this happens to DNA yeah and when it's exposed well, by the way it happens to lots of chemicals yeah you, you expose it to this kind of radiation and it breaks apart yeah and the, the thing is that when it breaks apart it can't function the way it was functioned in, when it was intact that's right. And, and it can lead to these very serious cancers and leukemia and all that. Now, this is such a big topic, and we're going to have you back if you will come, because I think we always have to kind of get to this point, and there's lots of other more interesting things, or interesting things to talk about in this issue. And uh, it was, it's always so great to have you here. So uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Blank. And I, I'd just like to thank all the volunteers and the staff of, of Shaw for uh, helping make this production possible. And uh, that concludes this segment of Citizens Forum. As the referendum on proportional representation grows closer, many groups in British Columbia are making their positions known. Hi, I'm Eleanor Vannon, and on this segment of Citizens Forum, I will be with Aaron Armutalu, from the British Columbia Federation of Students talking about their position on proportional representation. Aaron, thanks for coming today. Happy to be here. Uh, happy to have you here. So the British Columbia Federation of Students, what exactly is that? Right, so uh, the BC Federation of Students, or BCFS as, as we say, it's a provincial scale student organization and we really advocate for students' issues and, and we provide services and representation for students. And we represent over 130,000 students actually at 13 different universities and colleges from across every region in BC. Uh, and so we, uh, we're, we're kind of everywhere in terms of where our representation lies. And like I said, we provide services and representation and we advocate for student issues. And 
those issues are usually things like uh, you know reducing interest on student loans or having more upfront needs based grants for example and that's a lot of the work that we sort of do. So really you advocate uh, collectively as a larger voice for students? Definitely. It, uh, it's much more beneficial when students are able to have a united voice when they're talking to government or stakeholders when it comes uh, in terms to talking about student needs uh, versus having you know 25 different individual voices from all the different institutions. We're able to, to br unify a lot of those voices uh, and bring those together. So now we're here today to talk about proportional referendum and the upcoming uh, pro proportional representation of the upcoming referendum. Um, what is the BC Federation of Students position in this referendum? Yeah, so the BCFS voted to endorse electoral reform and specifically proportional representation. Uh, we as an organization have really endorsed the yes side and uh, as well the, the yes proponent uh, vote PRBC and, and their campaign that they're doing. And so our organization is, is in favor of a proportional representation system and, and uh, when it comes time over this sort of campaign period and leading on into the referendum in the fall, uh, we're definitely going to be uh, you know, pushing for the yes side and, and informing people about the referendum that's going on and, and sort of the benefits that PR brings for both students uh, and BC citizens everywhere. Now, you mentioned you represent students from 18 different institutions. That really spans the province from the north to the island. Um, there are a lot of different political views in this province. Did you find it was hard as an organization to come to a decision? Uh, 13, uh, okay. but uh, that's all right. Um, and uh, well, actually, no. Uh, you know, our organization, you know, we're nonpartisan. Uh, and so, like you said, we come from the island, the interior, the north, the mainland, and, and you know, we represent a huge number of students. And so when representatives from all those organi uh, student organizations come together uh, at a provincial scale, you know, you can imagine there's a, quite a few differing views. And uh, which is healthy, you know, being able to, to have a, a nice debate and conversation about things that we are, are planning on doing. Proportional representation, uh, when it, well, we were having that discussion, that, that was unanimous. It, it was uh, actually very straightforward as an organization to see that there, the benefits of that system for students and as well as everyone in BC was clear. And so when we had that, um, uh, that discussion on whether or not we were going to be supporting that, uh, it, uh, it was clear that our organization was, was on the side of, of supporting that. Now, um, typically your campaigns kind of focus on more concrete goals, reduction in student loan debt, financial assistance, the cost of textbooks. Why was proportional representation something you felt really would impact the lives of students? Yeah, definitely. With, uh, like you said, you know, our, our mandates and, and uh, what our, our core messaging is, is really focusing on like that high quality accessible post-secondary education. Uh, but as representatives of students and student issues, we are able to dabble into the other areas in which students are affected. You know, examples that we, we do are things like consent or equity, you know, those sorts of campaigns and that advocacy work because it, it does affect students. Uh, and then there are things like elections that go on and, and you know, we really try to do our best to be uh, running get out the vote campaigns and awareness campaigns so that uh, our members and students are, are aware of what's going on because it, it is things that affect them. And so the proportional representation is an example of that. It, it is something that affects our membership, it affects students, uh, and, and as well as all of British Columbians. And, and so uh, it, it's something that is definitely under the scope of the work that we do. And especially I think with students, um, their living situation is kind of in flux. They may live in one riding one year, another next year. Um, what would it do to the impact of student voices? Would it, would it change how well they're heard? Yeah, definitely. Uh, students, we, you know, they're, they're a transient demographic. You know, like you said, uh, they could be living in one place uh, at one point of time and living in another place at another point of time. And uh, as well, they have like uh, a lot of other sort of priorities are, are at the top of their minds. Uh, and so students and our, our issues are, are sometimes, you know, especially for, let's say, during elections for MLAs and candidates, uh, student issues can sometimes fall along the wayside. Uh, you know, we're often seen as, you know, uh, not the strongest at the ballot box. 
uh, even though that it's shown recently that actually our demographic is one that is beginning to vote quite heavily. Um, you know, and I don't, I don't think we'll ever know about the whole chicken or the egg uh, issue with student issues, you know. Uh, do candidates not prioritize student issues because students don't vote? Or do students don't vote because the, you know, our issues are not at the forefront? Regardless of how that works, uh, the current system right now is not really working. And proportional representation is a system that uh, will make it so that every vote does count. And, and so, uh, you know, MLAs and those in power are a lot more accountable to, to all their voters and, and all their constituents, not just uh, a, the majority to get them elected for their riding during election season. Now, the majority of people who are going to be eligible to vote in this referendum they're not students. Why should they care if a student organization has come out and said this is important to us? Definitely. Uh, I mean, uh, other than all, all the other things that, that we could talk a long uh, uh, time about with uh, the benefits of a proportional representation system, I mean, uh, people always like to talk about how students are, students are the future, right? Students are, are who is going to be taking up the mantle for everything next. They're going to be who are our doctors. They're going to be who is going to be in government. Uh, you know, students are really those folks who are the next generation, and, and that's how it always has been, and it will continue to be. Uh, and so, when folks are looking towards, uh, you know, the the younger demographics or, or student organizations in terms of where they're, uh, you know, they're looking at what their views of proportional representation is, they'll often find that many of them are in favor. Uh, and I think that's actually a really good indication that proportional representation is a system that works for everyone, not just a, a small amount of folks or, or those folks in power, uh, but actually it's a system that, that will benefit uh, uh, British Columbians as a whole, uh, and, uh, and we'll see what that looks like. Now, what are some of those benefits for people who maybe don't know about proportional representation? Definitely. Uh, I mean, propor proportional representation overall is, is a pretty straightforward system. Uh, right with first past the post, you have so whoever wins the a majority in that riding will get that seat, and then everyone else who voted for s that someone that didn't win, you will just. You, too bad. <laughs> um, and then under a proportional representation system, every vote matters. And so if uh, someone gets 40% of the vote, they get 40% of the seats in the legislature. Uh, versus right now where someone could get 40% of the vote and just get 100% of the power, uh, which actually uh, is not that great. Um, and so under proportional representation, you get a system where every vote counts. Um, and you're able to have representation where you normally would not have. You know, I, I think a great example is something like uh, the safe seats that exist, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, for example, uh, you know, a, a BC Liberal voter on Vancouver Island. They could spend their entire lives living on the island, voting for BC Liberals, and not see any representation their entire life. Uh, but under a proportional representation system, that uh, representation will exist um, because whatever because every vote does count. Whatever you're voting for is getting some sort of representation uh, in 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 the government. And now, what about cooperation? I mean, I am one of those young students, um, and and something that is really important to me is having cooperation. How does PR foster a different culture in government? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think what's great is that. Proportional representation, uh, it, it basically forces uh, organ political parties to, to work together. Uh, and it, right now, what you get is, you know, 40% uh, will vote, uh, get a political party 100% of the power, and then they will just force through all of their policies and their priorities and all that. Uh, and then, you know, in uh, an election or two, it will flip to the other political party and then they will tear down everything that was done and then force through theirs. And it's actually not a very sustainable system. Uh, under proportional representation, uh, the political parties will be f kind of forced to work together. And working together, actually, what we'll see is we'll see priorities and policies and, and the work that the government is doing that is the most reflective of the populations because by having to work together, uh, they will have to be, uh, you know, giving and taking uh, the things that are, you know, priorities for, for their party. And, uh, and that's good for BC citizens because then uh, 
the priorities and the policies that are being put through to govern uh, through government are going to be the ones that are the most representative representative of British Columbians. So it slows down the swing of the pendulum, really. Exactly. It kind of gets us to a nice middle ground. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, um, now if there's something you could say to the people watching right now who aren't students, you know, something from students, what would you like them to take away from this conversation? Uh, I think what's important to maybe hear is the fact, uh, again, that like w when you ask uh, a lot of the younger generations about you know, what their thoughts on proportional representation are, you will generally often hear that proportional representation is, is supported by our demographics because our issues are, again, often the ones that are put to the side. And under a proportional representation system you know, where every vote does count, it makes it so that all those other demographics that were not often very heard will actually have a voice. And for students, the, those are things like uh, interest on student loans or the high cost of tuition, or the high cost of textbooks, and things like upfront needs-based grants, uh, things that are important for us that uh, can make our lives better, which then in turn affects what the future of BC looks like. Uh, and so to us, a system of proportional representation is something that, that we know can not only benefit students, but, but everyone in BC. So students are really looking for some fairness, for someone to listen to their voice. And, and is, you know, am I correct in thinking that the BCFS really feels proportional representation is what's going to give that to students? Definitely. Uh, proportional representation will, will create that equity among uh, voters because, you know, uh, what we find is that, uh, again, a, usually a, a small demographic uh, interest is, is what is put as a priority, you know, whatever is going to get them to win or whatever is going to get them the most uh, donations, those sorts of things. Under a proportional representation, you, you remove that by making every vote count. And so you really are sort of uh, leveling the playing field and creating equity and, and fairness uh, among voters in terms of of, of all those issues and where those priorities are going to lie for candidates and MLAs. All right. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for coming. Um, and I'd like to thank Citizens Foreign for giving us this opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Um, again, our guest has been Aaron, uh, chairperson for the BC Federation of Students. Um, and it's been wonderful talking to you today. Happy to be here. Great. Thanks.